I'm Gabriel Haymans. Welcome to the broadcast tonight, right here, the Saturday night, 7 o'clock, November 17th, 2018. I want to welcome every one of you. I know some people were still joining. I want to welcome every one of you to this broadcast. And we're going to pray and ask the Lord to direct this service tonight, this whole broadcast. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you that Jesus did not leave us alone when he left this earth, but he sent us God, the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we thank you, Lord, for your ministry tonight. We ask you to speak through me, speak by me, pass me by if you need to, but let the message that you want to share with the church go forth tonight according to the Father's will and desire in Jesus' name. I take authority over every demon, over every spirit, and everything that will try to contradict what God is saying. I curse you in the name of Jesus. Let that which is of God stand and nothing else in the name of Jesus. Now, Lord, I pray that you would touch people that would watch this broadcast at different times, not just live tonight, but at different times, in the precious name of Jesus, and that you would minister divine truth to the hearts and minds of God's people in the precious name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Welcome tonight. We're glad to have you with us in what is going to be probably one of the most radical and in a sense one of the most difficult messages for me to share. However, this is not a bad message, but it is a warning to the church. And of course, if you know me and if you know the ministry that I've been blessed with from the Lord ever since I came to America and before then, my desire has always been to bring life and blessing and to promote the move of God and the outpouring of God. Most of my ministry so far has taken place during the season of the outpouring of the Spirit and of revival. And of course, our ministry is known for that, for having taken the move of God and revival of the 90s and early 2000s throughout this country and other countries of the world. But so tonight is a word that for some time the Lord has been speaking to me about. But here is something that's very, very important, especially for people who are truly standing in the office of the prophet, as I was called to and as I do. It doesn't mean that the first time God speaks something to you for the church that you're supposed to run and blab it all out. There's a time that the Lord would say things to us, and that word is going to incubate for a while, so to speak. And then the time comes when the Lord will say to you, speak this word now, release this word, and send it out to the body of Christ. Now, tonight is such a moment in time, and as I go through the message tonight, you will understand why this word is coming forth at this time. You will appreciate the significance of this as we go through this evening. Second of all, let me quickly say, our ministry has been in America since 1988. We've had a great blessed part in the last revival and are preparing now for the next one, which is soon to come. Our ministry can be found at GabrielHaymansMinistries.com. And of course, we invite every person to go onto our website. We have so many videos. In actual fact, we have over 400 videos, most of them on the website, some of them, the rest of them on YouTube that are available to people free of charge. Sometimes I think that is probably a mistake when you make things available, especially the great things of God for free. The church at large does not appreciate that. That's been my experience. However, whatever it may, may mean right now, it's available that way. But I want to speak to you just for a moment before I get going about the importance of being part of this ministry. Our ministry is one of the very few ministries that I know of in the United States that is right now doing the critical and crucial work of preparing the church for the next revival, nationally, internationally, and globally. And we'll talk about that tonight. It is of great importance, not so much for us, but for God's people to participate in this ministry. That means to follow this ministry, to receive of God through this ministry, and I promise you, I made this promise to the Lord 35 years ago when he called me to the ministry that I would always speak what the Holy Spirit speaks as a prophet and that I would be faithful to speak what the Lord says at the right time, at all times, to God's people. 
Ever since 2008, the Lord began to speak to me about preparing the church for this next great revival. That's what we've been doing. Now, not too many people are called to that. Sometimes God gives very specific assignments and instructions to different ministries. So when I say that I'm one of the few that is doing this, it's not that we're better or we're more special. It is just that God gives different assignments to different ministries, especially when it comes to apostles and prophets. And so we need to see it in that light. But I know in my spirit, and I know that I'm, I'm grieved in my spirit over these last few years, that so few people are participating in this ministry. We have hundreds and hundreds of people watching the broadcast all the time and sharing it, and many more watching it that we don't even know about. And of course, we're very excited about that, but so very few people participate in this ministry. People say, well, how do you know when people participate in this ministry, when they begin to become a part of it financially? It's amazing. Our treasure is where our heart is, and our heart is where our treasure is. When people begin to support the ministry, you know their heart is knitted to that ministry, or God has brought them to that ministry. And I pray tonight that the Lord would speak to you, many of you, to participate in this ministry and the unique ministry that we bring to the church in this final phase or period of time before the revival. It is extremely important, more so for the people of God than for us. And for our benefit, that you participate in this ministry, that you pray for us in the absolute crucial work that we're doing at this moment in time, that you participate in this ministry. As I'm saying, hundreds and hundreds of people watch the live broadcast. You never hear from them. You never see an offering come in. And of course, it's all on our website, very easy to find at GabrielHaymansMinistries.com. And to participate in this ministry, become a partner with this ministry, and so I want to urge you tonight to go before the Lord and let the Lord lead you and join this ministry in the absolute crucial work that we are doing at this time. Then also, the word that we bring is the prophetic word of God. It's not just a teaching. It's not just an exhortation. It is a word that is spoken by the Lord, and I'll say more about that in a moment. Please share this with people. Thank you for those of you that share the broadcast. But share this with people, and the people who need this the most are the pastors. Because pastors are not equipped to do what I'm doing, because I'm not equipped to do what they are doing. Their work is pastoral. They feed the sheep. They watch over the sheep. They care for the sheep. They're not called as prophets. They're not called as apostles. And so they need the true apostles of God, and they need the true prophets of God. And the church needs this ministry for the crucial prophetic word and message and light and insight that it's bringing to the church in this crucial final hour of preparation before the revival gets here. We are available to ministers and pastors right now. The Lord said to me, do not travel outside the United States. So for this time being, and this is my mission field, is the United States. God sent me here from South Africa. We are available. And people always say, well, how many thousand dollars does it take to get you here? I do not operate that way. I operate by the Holy Spirit. I do not operate by man's ways and means. And so I have never asked the pastor. I have preached in America in over 105 churches in the last 20 plus years. I've never asked anybody for a penny, but just receive an offering when I'm there. That's all. Many times you pay, pay your own cost, pay your own hotels and so on. Sometimes the churches want to do that. That's fine. But I've gone to many places, especially some small churches. They say, well, we can't afford to have you. And I'd say to the pastor, do you want this ministry in your church? Yes. I said, well, then I'm coming. And I'll pay my own way. I'll pay my own hotel, pay my own meals, everything. Just receive an offering. Give the people an opportunity to give. And just let them participate in this ministry. Because what you sow is what you reap. So that is what is important. And it's still the same way today. We never ask anybody for any money. We never ask any church. I have to have so much up front. That's of the devil, by the way. Did you know that? That's not God. And so we don't operate that way. We don't play man's games. Let me tell you this right now. I live in the absolute presence of God every day, but I live in a place of fear. And what I have to share with you tonight brings me to a place of, of, of anticipation, I should say, maybe not fear, because I do not fear man. I do fear the Lord. I love him. I worship him. I walk with him every day. But I'm in awe of him, and I've never become familiar with his presence and with his glory, that I lose my respect and my fear for God. Of course, a lot of that happens in the church, unfortunately, but soon God will put a stop to that. But what I will share with you tonight 
is a warning to the church, which is good because we're going to hear this as a warning. Now, let me say this ahead of time, and I will explain this and qualify this in a moment. What I'm sharing with you tonight is not a teaching. It's not an exhortation. It's not a discussion. It's not open for discussion. It doesn't come from my head. It comes from the Lord. Let me just say this. Because there's, there's so little of the truth that is preached in the church today, it's sad. And so Christians don't know what the prophet is. Christians think that if somebody walks up to you and says, yeah, yeah, that saith the Lord, that's a prophet. Well, sometimes it's just a familiar spirit that speaks through the person. A prophet is, first of all, somebody who's called of God to be in the ministry. And if you read through the Bible, from the Old Testament all the way through the New Testament, every prophet that God had ever called, he appeared to supernaturally. There's so many people today running around, well, I'm a prophet. Well, did the Lord appear to you? What did he say to you? What was the calling? What was the assignment that he gave you? What did he say to you when he called you? And prophets are, first of all, called to the fivefold ministry because they're part of the fivefold ministry. They don't just prophesy, yea, yea, yea. They preach and teach and minister the word of God. They lay hands on the sick. They minister the gifts of the Spirit. And they minister the word of the Lord and so on. So they fivefold ministry, first of all. So... So what I'm saying to you tonight is a prophetic word from God. Now, how does the word of the Lord come to a prophet? I sometimes hear people say, well, you know, I believe the Lord said this. Well, this, I'm a prophet of God. I believe the Lord said this. That's hogwash. Let me tell you how God speaks to a prophet. And people think, well, when you're a prophet, God speaks to you every day. No, not this one, not prophetically, not in your office. He speaks to me personally in my spirit, like every other Christian. I've got to be quiet to hear the still small voice of the Holy Spirit in my spirit, or most of the time to pick up that witness of the Holy Spirit in my spirit. That's how God speaks to me personally, the same way he speaks to every Christian. And as I say, sometimes it's just the witness of the Holy Spirit. When he speaks to a prophet prophetically, that means God speaks to you in your office of ministry. It is always audible. To, to, to the person, to me. Every time that God has spoken to me in the past prophetically, it was audible. To me, it was audible. And I'd ask people sometimes around me, did you hear that? And they didn't hear that once in a while. Some, somebody will hear it audibly too. But when God speaks to the prophet, it's that way from the time of Moses all the way to the end of the Bible. And that is the way it is with the prophet. God speaks to the prophet in an audible fashion. That's why the prophet in the Old Testament says, the word of the Lord came unto me. In some places it says, came unto me in my ears, came unto me audibly. Why? Because the prophet has to hear everything God says, because from the moment God speaks to a prophet, their prophet or prophetess is accountable and responsible for that word to deliver it, not at any time, but to deliver it even at the time when God says, now give that message that I've given you. So you become responsible. When the Lord first called me to the prophet's office, I was frightened. I, 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 was, I was sad. I, I, I was not comfortable with it because I, I understood. At that time, I understood the responsibility. I understood the awesome responsibility of the prophet's office. And I begged the Lord to change that, but he would not. That's his business. Now, also, it doesn't mean that because you're a prophet or an apostle now that you're on a higher level. Yes, you have a greater authority because you're the foundation of the church. Ephesians 2 tells you that. Apostles and prophets form the foundation. You have a greater authority, but not to lord it over the other fivefold ministry. That's not what it is. Every fivefold ministry is responsible to and accountable to the Lord Jesus Christ for themselves. Hallelujah. So it doesn't mean prophets can run around and say, well, you know, because God gave me this word over you, pastor, you've got to change. No, that's unscriptural. See, that, that's the spirit of manipulation and control that is so frequent and so prevalent in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ today, unfortunately. So what I'm saying tonight to you is the result of things the Lord has shared with me over time. But this last week, the Lord said to me, it's time to issue this warning and began to talk to me about it. Clearly what he wanted me to do. And thank you, Lord, Holy Spirit, for helping me tonight to do that. Do it accurately and do only that in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. So I want to tell you tonight what the audible prophetic word of the Lord is for the church right here at this time. Hallelujah. Now, let me say this also because there's so much error. And please, I'm going to qualify what I say in a moment. There's so much error. I mean, so much chaos in the church, like a circus. 
You don't even know what people believe anymore. Most people don't even believe the word anymore. Most people don't believe Christians, don't believe the New Testament. Most of them live in the Old Testament. It's, it's such chaos. The church has come to a place of total chaos and disarray. And, and, and the, the judgment I'm talking about tonight is, first of all, it's a judgment for the world, and it's a judgment for the church that I would warn you about that is coming very soon. But this is not the judgment of the Old Testament where there was very little grace and the ground would just open up and swallow people. It's not that kind of judgment. We do not live in the Old Testament. Even though most of the church is living half in the Old Testament, half in the New Testament, which is an abomination to God. And I'll talk about that some more here in a minute because this is one part of the warning that's coming to us. We do not live in the Old Testament, number one. Number two, we do not live in the time of the seven-year tribulation, which Daniel spoke of, which Jesus spoke of, and which the book of Revelation explains to us. We do not live in that time. There are different time periods in the Bible called dispensations or seasons of time. We're living now in the time of grace or the season of grace or the season of the church, which began with the ascension of Jesus and will conclude with the return of Jesus on the clouds of glory to receive his end time harvest, the whole church, everybody who's born again at that time, receive him to heaven. And then, of course, the seven years of tribulation will come. So understand this. And here again is so much error that it just, oh my God, it just frustrates you sometimes. You have to forgive me. I'm just human too. It's like the, the fires in California. Now. Oh, it's, it's God is judging them now. In this time, in this dispensation, in this season of the church, which began with the ascension of Jesus and concludes with his return to receive the end time harvest. In this 2,000 year plus season, God does not judge the world through nature and through the environment. That he will do in the next dispensation, the dispensation of the seven years of tribulation. After the church is gone, then he will. People say, well, what about the fires in California? Let me tell you something. Jesus gave you the answer. I love what R. Roberts said years ago. He said, God is a good God and the devil is a bad devil. And, and the church still has a problem in understanding that. I thought that was simple. God is a good God. Jesus said, I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. The thief, the devil comes to steal, kill and destroy. There it is. There's a distinction. Very simple. The devil comes to steal, kill and destroy. Jesus said, I am come that you might have life. And have it more abundantly. God is a good God. The devil is a bad devil. And for the last 2,000 years, God's message to the world, God's plan with the world, God's plan with this dispensation is to reap the harvest, to, to save, to deliver, to set free, to bring into his kingdom. It's the time of seed time and harvest in the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Besides that, those people that want to say, now God is now judging California with the fires. Well, then that makes God a respecter of persons. Because there's some parts of America that's even worse than California. Talk about some parts of New York, Chicago. So God's not judging Chicago. Chicago, the murder capital of the city, of this country. So God's not judging them, but he's judging California. Then next week, some kind of catastrophe breaks out in, in a country that is wonderful. And people say, well, why is God judging them? God is not judging people in the dispensation of grace through the events of nature. Once we're gone and the tribulation begins, the book of Revelation is clear that then he will cause all sorts of natural disasters, spiritual disasters, all kinds of disasters in the seven year tribulation period, which would befall Israel, except every Jew that's born again like me, we're going up to be with the Lord, hallelujah. We're part of the church. Huh. Hey, my brothers and sisters haven't learned that yet. You're not a Jew anymore when you're born again. You're part of the church. You're part of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because salvation is not in the old covenant. Salvation is through the Lord Jesus Christ. Salvation is not through the law. Salvation is through the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ only. Hallelujah. I thought that was simple, but many times you have to repeat that. You have to repeat so many things. Besides that, God does not have the devil do his judgment for him. So now God's mad with California. So, okay, devil, will you go and judge there for me? God does not use the spirit of Beelzebub. God does not use any spirit of the devil. God does not use any demon spirit. God does not cross the kingdoms. We do that mentally. We do that intellectually. We do that doctrinally. Should be ashamed of it. 
God does not do that. God uses his own judgment when he wants to. So all of these things that are happening, disasters in the world, wars, everything. Yes, it's all part of what the devil is doing because he's the one that comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Praise God. All right. So would you turn with me tonight, if you have a Bible with you, to the book of Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. What I want to share with you about tonight are basically two things. Number one, I want to talk to you about a judgment, or call it a prejudgment, probably a better term, a prejudgment of what is about to hit the world and the world system. And then I want to talk to you about a judgment that's coming to the house of God, which will be after that, which is something very, very real that we are going to have to prepare for. And we have to do so speedily. Now, the judgment that's coming to the world is what I call a judgment of obstacles. It is amazing to me how the church has failed God in everything. As Jesus looks at the church tonight, he is not happy. He has fire in his eyes. I'm going to talk about this. I'll qualify this to you tonight. And so many pastors over the years have said to me, Brother Gabriel, don't say anything against the church. Don't, don't criticize the church. Well, it's amazing that Paul didn't know that. It's amazing the Holy Ghost didn't know that. We think because we're the body of Christ, we're beyond reproach. We're born again only in spirit. Our soul, man, the mind, will, intellect, and emotions, and the flesh, man, is still here and still got the same nature it was born with, the nature of sin and death. And that is what's responsible for most of the problems. Now, God has an end time plan. He speaks of this often, even through the Old Testament prophets as well as in the New Testament. God has an end time plan. It is to me absolutely amazing. I wonder over this, how that the church at large, I'm not saying every church, I'm not saying every denomination. The church at large seems to have no interest in what God is interested in. The church seems to have no understanding of the prophetic times we live in. It's amazing how in America everybody's prophetic. But I'm telling you the truth. It's not prophetic. It's pathetic. Because there are two elements of the prophetic that God is going to hold you responsible for and me. He's going to hold us responsible for in the next few years to come. Number one is to know the prophetic times. Number two is to know God's plan at this time. We have reached this year on Monday, May the 14th, we reached the 70 year celebration, the 70 year mark of the independence of the nation of Israel. And it seems like nobody is even concerned about it. Nobody's even looking at that. It looks like nobody's even talking about that. But Jesus spoke when he was on the earth. Not even Peter, Paul, James, or John, or Jeremiah. Jesus spoke when he was on the earth, and he said, of course, he was speaking to the Jews. Oh, I'm sorry, the church doesn't know that. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he's not speaking to the church. There is no church there. There was no church. He's speaking to Israel. He was sent to the household of Israel. He's speaking to the church, uh, to Israel. He's telling Israel what will happen in the end times of Israel, not the church. The end time teaching of the church is in John 14, 15, 16, where Jesus told his followers how he would come back for them. And the rest of it are in the epistles, mostly written by Paul, of the time when the Lord would come back to receive us unto himself. We're not in the gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's just the freebie. Hallelujah. Now. Jesus said, speaking to Israel, but we take note of this because we live in this final generation. When the fig tree blossoms, he's using Jewish vernacular. The fig tree, Israel being a top of the, or the fig tree being a top of Israel in the Old Testament. When it blossoms, when it comes back to life. And ever since this, the spring or, or May of the year 606 BC, from that time on until Friday, May the 14th, 1948, for a period of 2,590 years. Israel never blossomed. The nation was never reborn. The nation never became independent or sovereign. But it happened. So Jesus spoke of this. That when this happens, know that when this happens, this generation, again speaking Jewish vernacular, meaning the generation born at that event, very simple, will not pass away 
until all the end time events will take place. Now, I'm just going to be frank with you, even though I'm Gabriel. It looks like the church is calling Jesus a liar. It looks like nobody pays attention to this. Jesus made understanding of the times in our time very simple. Now, there are many other time cycles and sequences of the Bible that you can study, and it all brings you to this time. That's a beautiful, wonderful, in-depth study, which is wonderful. We don't have to do that. Jesus made it simple for every person. Children can understand this. It's easy. I mean, the kids nowadays, my God, by the time they're five, year old, five years old, they run around on a cell phone, you know, like they're instructors of the phone. It's amazing what they learn. But a child can add, and a child can understand that 70 years since a generation, is not 40 years, it's the duration of the generation, which is 70 to 80 years. Since that is 70 to 80 years, any child can tell you that we have reached 70 years of this generation, which means we have a maximum of 10 years left. What does that mean? That means that we're coming to the end. Soon, we're coming to the end of the dispensation of grace. How does this dispensation end? Well, here's the second thing of great importance. Looks like nobody hardly is interested in this. It ends with a global outpouring of God's Spirit on all flesh, on all persons, all people, all nations, all countries, doesn't matter where you're from, which will then result in a global revival, which will produce a global harvest of billions of souls, because the harvest is based on the principle of Pentecost. A Pentecost, an old-time Jewish Pentecost harvest, is a crop failure at 90%. It's a crop failure. This is the absolute majority of the world. Now, I know it's hard to relate to these numbers, astronomical numbers. But the Lord is coming back somewhere in the next 10 years or less. Or he may delay the time, like in the time with the battle with Israel when he caused the sun to stand still. He may do so. But what we know is that somewhere in the next 10 years or less, there's going to be an outpouring of God that will shake the earth, just like Haggai prophesied, the heavens, the earth, everything will be shaken. The Spirit of God will be poured out upon all people. doesn't matter who you are, what religion, no religion, atheist, whatever, doesn't matter. And the harvest will be brought in because God pre-scheduled this from before the foundation of the world, which means you don't have to pray for it. Just make sure that you'll be part of it. Hallelujah. So this is what's about to come about. I cannot understand why every pastor would not get up on Sunday morning and say, Glory to God, we're in the 70th year of the final generation, and the great outpouring of God all over the world will start soon. Let's prepare our hearts. Let's draw closer to God. Let's get ourselves ready. Oh my God, we are the generation of the great glory of God. Why are these things not proclaimed every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night? Because the church is not hooked up with God. The church is hooked up with religion, tradition, man-made doctrines, denominational doctrines, and bullcrap that has nothing to do with God. And soon the church will be judged for this. But I'm here to tell you about it and warn you so that you don't become part of this judgment. Now, what is God's end time plan? The 12 things, real quickly. Next thing to happen, the next event on God's end time plan is the outpouring of the fire and the glory on the church. First thing. Number two, that will bring the transformation of the church because most of what's in the church, 95% or 99% of it, is going to get burned up. And then out of the ashes of a church burned by fire, God will pour His glory in and then raise up the glorious church. Hallelujah. Then what will happen is the outpouring of the Spirit will come upon all of the world. That will trigger a global revival which will result in a global harvest of billions and billions of souls, over 7 billion people. At the end of this glorious revival, the Lord Jesus will appear on the clouds of glory and receive the church and, of course, all the new souls, all the harvest up into glory. Hallelujah. And then we'll start the seven-year tribulation period on earth as we stand before the judgment seat of Christ and we're judged for all the deeds that we've done since we were born again. Everything before you're born again is blotted out and destroyed. And then, of course, also... We stand there and receive the rewards that He has for us based upon what we've done, how we've obeyed Him or not. And then, of course, we enjoy and feast the marriage supper of the Lamb, 
while the seven year tribulation takes place on earth. Then we come back with Jesus for the battle of Armageddon, where after he cleanses the whole place of Israel and the earth, and then he cleanses the temple and starts to reign and rule in the temple for a thousand years. And we are posted as his governors all over the world to help him rule and reign the world for a thousand years, called the thousand year millennial reign. Then after that, at the end of the thousand years, the devil, the Antichrist, the false prophet, and the demons would have put in the pit right at the end of Armageddon before his rule began, are then led out of the, t out of the pit. The devil comes one more time through the earth, stirs up the whole earth, and cause a final rebellion at which time everyone, including all of Israel, will have to individually choose to go with the devil or to, or to go with Jesus. And then there's a final outpouring of fire from heaven where God destroys all of these enemies. And the next thing, we stand at the great white throne of judgment where we stand with Jesus, the church, and we judge Israel, we judge the world, and we, watch, we, and we judge demons. Hallelujah. At the great white throne judgment. Then after that, this earth and the heavens are destroyed by fire. Then God reveals the new heavens and the new earth, and eternity begins for all eternity. That's the 12-point plan. Hallelujah. This is the kind of stuff you want to preach every Sunday. If you don't put the plan of God before people, they would not know. Now, here's something I learned about Christians. People, please don't hold this against me. Christians are sheep. They follow. They find someone to follow. And it's not the Holy Spirit. We're supposed to follow the Holy Spirit first. It's not Jesus because, guess what? I've got a secret for you. He's not here. He's in heaven. Don't tell anybody I told you. The church act like he's on earth, but it's error. Now, he may come down and visit you. He may step down right now here if he wants to. But when he gets done, he goes back to heaven. But he did not leave us alone. In the forbidden chapters of the Bible, you can read about Jesus, how that he sent us, that he promised that he would send the Holy Spirit in person and in power. And he did. It doesn't mean that he's not here because the church ignores him. He is here, praise God. He's available to us as a person. He is available to us in His presence and power and all of His glory. He is available to us. But of course, this, the church has pretty much disfellowshipped Him. Now, so I want to share this with you tonight. If you look at the church, and I'm going to give you some scripture in a moment, okay? Just be, before you think that I'm mad at the church. I'm not mad at the church. I'm frustrated because I work in the church. And to work in the church for God, if you do it God's way, is a place of frustration. But hey. Been 35 years of doing it, you get used to it. Hallelujah. Now, the church received a great commission from Jesus. Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, and so on. Those who believe in my name, baptized, will be saved. Those who believe not shall be damned. These sons shall follow them that believe in my name. In my name. Not through fasting and prayer and binding and losing intercession. In my name. In my name. They will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They'll lay hands on the sick. In my name. Hello. In my name. Yeah, but back in Matthew, Jesus said, well, these can't will not come. That's before he died, honey. Everything changed. The moment Jesus died, then everything changed again when he was resurrected. The moment he died, the old covenant was fulfilled and closed out. The moment he was resurrected, the new covenant was born and salvation was given to us. Read 1 Corinthians 15. See how Paul explains this. We have no faith. We have no basis of nothing if it's not for the new covenant. Now, here's the shocker. Are you ready for the shocker? It's time to tell the truth, my God. The law of Moses died the moment Jesus took his first breath. Not when he died. Not when he was resurrected. Prove it to me. I'll prove it to you right now. If you follow the ministry of Jesus, you will see that wherever he went, he went out of his way to go against the law. And so the Pharisees come to him and say, why, why do your disciples not wash their hands as a ceremonial cleansing of Moses? Why do you heal on the Sabbath? Almost looked like he was trying to find somebody sick on the Sabbath. Now, either the law was fulfilled when Jesus was born, or Jesus was the number one sinner and transgressor of the law. Now, if Jesus disobeyed the law while it was still in effect, then he would be a sinner. So if the law was still in operation while Jesus was on the earth, then Jesus would be a sinner. Well, we know that's not true because Jesus is not a sinner. So guess what? The law was fulfilled when he was born. 
The moment he was born, a new dispensation actually began, the dispensation of the Messiah and of his rule of the government of God. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, he's anointed me to preach the gospel and so on, Isaiah 61. There was the government of the Messiah. And as Isaiah tells you uh, and that he was born, glory to God, he was born with that government upon his shoulders, hallelujah. Yeah. By the way, praise God, I, I give that for free, hallelujah. Truth, praise God, truth, 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 truth. Very little of that in the church, but the fire is coming. It's going to destroy all of this. Now, let's look at the church tonight briefly. The Great Commission. How successful are we? Well, I just finished up my new book, which will soon be available. It's going to be a shocker. I'm going to knock some religious stuff in the head, Lord, to God. Hallelujah. Demons are squealing already. Praise God. us in the church. Not the world's demons, the church demons. But Jesus said, go and save the world. The Great Commission. After 2,000 years of being at it, here's the latest statistic. 33% of the world's population claim to be Christian. Did you know that? Now, now we don't know that they're all born again. But let's be in a good mood tonight and just say, okay, well, let's say all 33% of those who claim to be Christian are truly born again. Now, I know that's not true. I don't know what the correct number is. I know that, that there are many Christians who are in church, they're not born again. You say, how do you know that? <laughs> because many of them are, are just churchified. They, they weren't justified into salvation. They weren't justified in the Spirit. I'm going to shock you. Put your seatbelt on a few shockers come for you this night. You call people up and they say, well, say after me quickly and you'll be born again. You're not born again for just repeating words like some parrot bird. Paul tells me that godly sorrow, well, Romans chapter 3 verse 4, godly sorrow leads to repentance. We just want to gather people quickly. Well, okay, now we're going to give the statistic. 500 people got saved. They did not get saved. You do not get saved until the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin, John 16, and you come to godly sorrow and break down and go on your face before God and cry out to God and weep before Him and ask Him to save you. You don't get saved without your heart breaking. Jesus' life and His body was broken for you. You could not get saved until He was broken. And you do not get saved until you are broken. You're welcome. I preach the truth. Glory to God. This is why most of these people we see in these evangelistic crusades standing up there. Do the parrot thing. That's why they never show up in church. They never become a constructive member. They never live for God. What happened to them? They were not born again. Now I have all the evangelists mad at me. You're welcome. Praise God. We're going to speak the truth tonight. And you need to hear all of it. Because we're in the firing line of God's judgment. This is the first time in 35 years of ministry. You have to understand, I'm not new to this. Basically, I've been born in the church. My dad was the pastor at our local church. I've been 61 years, my whole life, I've been in the church. And it's gone from bad to worse. To beyond what I ever thought it would be. But the Lord spoke this to me. Back in the 90s, when we had the joy revival, the Lord said to me, enjoy this. Because when this is gone, the church will backslide into a place that you would think would never be possible. Actually, in fact, in the mid-90s, if you said to me, Gabriel, is this revival going to change the church? I would have said to you, yes. I mean, positively change the church. To begin a walk with God. To walk in the Spirit. Live in the Spirit. It did the opposite. Well, not the revival. But because the church did not embrace the person of the revival, the Holy Spirit. Now, so when it comes to judging the success of the church, the Great Commission, our first order of business with 33%, I'm going to be positive tonight and say, well, you know, it's not but 33, but the, the statistic, we are at the most 33% successful. 33% is an F, it's a failure. Now, I want to bring this to your attention. If you look at Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation 3, chapters 2 and 3, God there, by the Holy Spirit, is speaking to seven churches in Asia. And of the seven churches, one church is commended and praised, the church of Philadelphia. The other six are criticized and rebuked. Oh, brother, you should not rebuke the church. Well, God does. Once again, Holy Ghost does. The Bible, the Word of God, is good for correction, it's for instruction, it's also good for rebuke. 
the church today needs to pay attention to the Spirit of God. And if we individually listen to the Spirit of God, we will receive a very strong rebuke. Now let me say this to you. We as Christians look at the world and say, look, look how miserable. Look what the church, what the world is coming to. Let me tell you this. I'm quite impressed with the world. For sinners and people who are lost, who don't have salvation, who don't know God, they're not doing too bad. It's the church that's the problem. The place is supposed to be full of life, full of God, full of answers. But the church looks at us and they don't see God because we don't have God to show them. We show them religion. We show them a system, a man-made system with our own doctrines, our own rituals, but we believe our own denominations and abominations, whatever, and they rightfully call us religious people because the church is not a people of God. The church is a people of religion. How do you know it? Because for 61 years of my entire life, just about every church I've ever walked in, the Holy Spirit is not there. Religion is there. The name of Jesus is used. Worship songs are being sung. They're beautiful chandeliers and carpets and, and platform and everything. But God in person is not there. Say, so why not? Because he's not welcome. He's not welcome. If he was there, there'd be signs and wonders and miracles every Sunday. But he's not there. Now, of the seven churches in Asia. Now, remember, see this in, in context. This was at the end of... Or towards the end of the first generation of the church. John is down the island of Patmos. Peter is dead. Paul is dead. And you would think that at the end of the first generation of the church. That the church would still be very spiritual. But it's not. It's one out of seven. That's 14 point something percent. 14 percent. This is at the end of the generation that started the church. Of the outpouring signs and wonders. Peter, Paul, James and John. All these miraculous ministries. At the end or towards the end of that generation, the first generation, I call it the first apostolic era of the church. At the end of the first apostolic era of the church, there's in Asia Minor. And I know that's not all the churches. There were other churches, of course, all the churches of Paul in Jerusalem, Antioch. And so on. But of the seven churches in Asia Minor, one of the seven is commended by God. One of the seven. That's 14%. Now, let me share some scriptures with you that are important. If we criticize the church based on the scripture and by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, we do God's work. If you think today the church is doing great, nothing could be further from the truth. The church at large is an abomination to God because God is not there. There's rituals, there's formats, there's systems, there's doctrines. There's a system of religion that has nothing to do with God, the Holy Spirit, because he's not there. And sometimes it has little to do with even Jesus. If you look at what happened from the time of the early church, Holy Ghost has poured out signs and wonders and miracles. And 300 years later, the Catholic church comes out of that. From revival, the outpouring of the Spirit, signs and wonders to a Catholic system, which is ungodly and worships Mary instead of Jesus. You think how in the world that the church translate itself from Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost, signs and wonders and miracles, a few hundred years later, you have a system that is so far from God, he might as well worship the devil. How did this happen? But that, that's, not, that's not all. Listen to this. Look at the early church where Peter, Paul, James, and John were present. I'm just going to use a few examples. First Corinthians 14. Paul says, this disorderly conduct among you, you shout and scream to one another. There's no respect for one another. There's chaos in the service instead of preferring one another. In 1 Corinthians 11, 17, 18, you come together for the worst, for strife, not for good. Not for good. That's the church that Paul established. James says, James chapter 4, 1 and 2, there's fighting, there's hatred, there's even murder in your heart as you come together. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. There's immorality among you. I mean, it's so bad where somebody has his father's wife. This is the early church. Galatians 5 and 15. Paul says, since you are striving with one another, be careful that you won't bite and devour and destroy one another. The church of Galatia. 
This is a church that Paul established. I mean, right there in the time when Paul was still active in ministry. James 5, 16, confess your sins to one another and you'll be healed and restored. So why are people not healed and restored? Because they live in sin. Now, I want to read this to you, Galatians chapter 2. Listen to this. Paul says this, he says, I'm reading Amplified. My precaution was because of false brethren. He's speaking to the church in Galatia. False brethren, some men who were Christians in name only, that slipped in. And some had been secretly smuggled into the brotherhood, he says. They slipped in to spy on our liberty in Christ, Jesus, that they might again bring us to bondage according to or by the law of Moses. Bring us to bondage of the law of Moses. Now, you want to know, I'm going to say it right here, right now. And I'm going to go to, not put my head on that pillow, I'm going to sleep in peace. I'm going to wake up tomorrow morning and shout and rejoice. You see, the Lord said to me many years ago when he first called me to the ministry, he said to me, if you will speak what I say as a prophet, of course, I, I, I entered the full-time ministry on April 22nd of 1983. I never stood in the prophet's office until Sunday afternoon of October 19, 1986. But the Lord said to me, if you're faithful to me, not to the people. See, that's a problem with most ministers and pastors. They try to be faithful and please the people. Forget that. I'm going to stand before Jesus one of these days. And most of you may be mad at me. Which I will endure. Until I stand before Jesus. Because when I stand before him. I have vowed before God. When he called me to the ministry. 35 years ago. I said Lord I vow before you. I have many shortcomings and failures in the natural. Like everybody else. But I have my own. But I will speak what you say speak. And as a prophet. I will. What I hear you speak to me audibly as a prophet. I will speak when you say and how you say. That's why I'm here tonight. And the Lord said to me then. Here's something to be learned from this. If you will always obey me and walk in love. See, so what's that? <laughs> That's something the church don't know anything about either. Don't worry about that right now. If you walk in love with people and when they attack you, forgive them. And when they forsake you, forgive them. When they turn against you, forgive them. And walk in love and obey me in everything I tell you to say that. He said, I will cause your life to be prosperous. I will keep you in good health even into old age. I'm on my way there. I'm 61. Don't know what sickness or disease is. Nothing. <laughs> People always at doctors and places like that. The Lord said to me, if you do this, I will do that. That's why I'm healthy and strong tonight. I'm going to stay that way. So I'm going to obey Holy Spirit tonight. Hallelujah. Glory to God. If you look at the church, Jesus said, now, I call this the forbidden chapters of the New Testament. John 14, 15, 16, 17. Jesus said to the disciples, I am leaving you. Most Christians don't know he's gone. They're taught every Sunday he's there. Jesus is not on the earth. He may visit here, as I said earlier on, and then go back when he's done. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He's sitting on his own throne and in his own glory, a glory higher than any man would ever have, a glory higher than any being in the universe would ever receive. Jesus received that highest honor and glory because he obeyed the Father in his mission to the earth. If he was in the earth today still, he'd be missing out on the greater glory that the Father would want to bestow on him. But he's not. It was. Read the first chapter of the book of Hebrews. He's exalted in the highest position of honor and glory, seated at the right hand of the Father, where he lives right now to make intercession for us. But Jesus said, I'll not leave you alone, because I'm not going to let you make a religion out of me. But the church did it anyway. 99% of the church has made a religion out of him by casting the Holy Ghost out the door and came up with alternatives and doctrines of demons and doctrines and studies of demons. The demons moved in. Now let me say this to you. God the Holy Spirit is the light in the midst of the church. He's the lampstand. When you remove the light... You're in darkness. You're still born again in your spirit. And God still lives in your spirit individually. But corporately, you move into the place of utter darkness. That's what's happening in most churches every Sunday. There's darkness there. And there's darkness in the place. And the whole church is in darkness. Because the Holy Ghost is cast out the door. Now, there's coming a judgment to you and to me. To the whole church. To whomever it's applicable. That's not going to come to me. Because I'm not going to have this. Because I won't submit to this. For, for the church rejecting God the Holy Spirit. 
Now, I, I'm going to sleep in peace tonight after this message. So I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you straight. I'm old enough and wise enough, praise God, to make sure that this comes out the right way. I've preached for many pastors all over the world in the last 35 years. And pastors, you know, they're under a lot of pressure. I understand. I have sympathy for the pastors. But I don't have any sympathy for you if you go against the Holy Spirit. Because when you go against the Holy Spirit, you go against what Jesus said. Jesus didn't say, when I get up to heaven, I'm going to do an emergency drop of Bibles. You know, I'll get you some New Testament Bibles, even before Peter, Paul, James, and John would write it down. And as soon as I get to the Father, I'm going to make a, make a big drop of New Testament Bibles. He never promised you a New Testament Bible. He did, to the apostles, give us the word of the new covenant. But that was not what he promised. He promised you God in person, God the Holy Spirit. And for 2,000 years, the church has despised him and cast him out the door. Now, I'm speaking to your pastors right now. Many pastors over the years said to me, Brother Gabriel, you know, I, I really want the Lord to have more part of my... Well, get up and stand in front of your people and say, you know what? Today, we're done with religion. We stop today. I curse every religious devil, demon, Custom, rich, or whatever we have here, we'll throw it out. Today, I'm giving this church to the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. I'm going to sit down and shut up till he tells me to get up and what to do. I'm going to go home this week and spend in his presence. When I come back next Sunday, I will be prepared to bring you what God wants. And the service will not be printed out on computer the night before, point one, point two, point three. Now we worship, then we have the offering. We'll come back with a service that Holy Spirit will be in charge of. He would regulate it from beginning to end. He's going to move. He's going to fall. He's going to minister. If you don't want that, this is no longer your church. I challenge you. You that are pastors, I challenge you. You either do it now. Or soon the fire comes and will judge you for it. Amen. Now, I'm saying this in love, but I'm going to tell you the truth tonight. As I said, I'm going to lay in that bed tonight and sleep in peace. There is a judgment that is going to begin at the house of God. Amen. Just like Peter said. And it's very soon. Because the next event on God's calendar is the outpouring of the fire. Here's what the Lord has spoken to me for years. I've, not, I've hinted about this. I've not, never spoken. I'll tell you clearly tonight. Pastor or minister or overseer or moderator, if you have spiritual authority over other people's lives, you are in trouble if you are not walking and living in the Holy Spirit and if your church is not under the control of the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you how people read this, you know. It's not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. No, 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 no. It's not by might, not by power, but by myself. I'm the pastor here. I'm in charge here. I decide, what, I, I decide what doctrine we have. I decide what we teach. We decide whether we will allow Holy Spirit in our church. Well, we won't because our abomination, excuse me, our denomination says that, uh, that uh, we, we don't raise our hands. We don't speak in tongues. That's of the devil. We don't cast out devils. That's of the devil. We don't allow the power of God in here. That's of the devil. I'm telling you, whatever you preach and say, whether you're Baptist, Presbyterian, or whatever you are, or Pentecostal, whatever you have sinned against the Holy Spirit and the New Testament, Testament and against Jesus, you will be judged for when the fire of God falls. And I'm going to tell you what the Lord said to me. Many pastors will die the moment the fire of God hits the church. Christians will be judged on a different basis. And I don't know to what extent. But the Lord said to me, the shepherds that are stood in my way. One day I sat in my office and the presence of God was on me so strong. And he's so frustrated. I said, Holy Spirit, what is going on? He said, I've spoken to many pastors around the world, some of them for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years and more. And I've spoken to them. I said, hand your church over to me. Allow me to come into your church. Let me be the lampstand in the midst of this church. Let me be in charge of you and of this church. Allow me to minister to these people instead of you. And I will minister with you and through you. I want to minister to the body of Christ. And they have said no for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. I'm telling you, as a man of God, when the fire falls, we bury you. You're done. You go to heaven. But when you see Jesus at the pearly gate, he'll have fire in his eyes. And you'll fall at his feet and beg for his mercy. I don't want you to do this. I don't want you to go through this. This is very, very serious. There are two things. Now, here's what the church preaches. Oh, you mustn't steal. You mustn't desire another person's car, wife, husband, money. You mustn't hurt somebody. All physical sin is what the church preaches against. Physical sin is sin. But that is not the highest order of sin. 
People don't go to hell one day for stealing a car, for robbing a bank, for having living in adultery. You don't go to hell for those things. You go to hell one day for having rejected Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life. In other words, you're going to hell one day if you're not born again because you have rejected God's salvation. It's spiritual sin. It's not physical sin that takes you to hell. Hello? Hello? Yeah. Second Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. It says, let, let, Paul says, let us cleanse ourselves from all sin of the flesh and sin of the spirit. That doesn't mean you commit it with your spirit. That means the nature of the sin is spiritual. Look at uh, Ephesians chapter 4. Envy, bitterness, strife, division, all those things that are among you. These things ought not to be. Galatians 5, uh, Paul says, you know, you, you, you bite and devour one another. These are spiritual sins. There are sins that are spiritual in nature. You commit them with your natural man, but their nature is spiritual. Rejecting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior is not something you do with your spirit. You do it as a person. You do it with your will. But it's a spiritual sin. And the church does not preach against spiritual sin. Why not? Because the church is not spiritual. It's religious. People go to hell every day, not because they robbed the bank, not because they committed fraud, not because they stole somebody else's wife, because they rejected the salvation of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. There are two reasons why the church is going to be severely judged real soon, and the judgment starts at the top. If you're the moderator over many churches, it starts with you. The higher your authority the more severe the judgment would be. The more people you are responsible for, the more people that you are blocking from the Holy Spirit standing in the Holy Spirit's way, the more will you be judged. And we'll bury you. I, I, I don't do funerals, so I won't bury you. But I will stand before the Lord tonight for I put my head on that pillow. And every day from here on out, because I'm obeying God tonight, this is not easy to do, but I'm going to obey God. I don't care who gets mad at me. I'm not here to please people. I'm 61 years old. I'm happy. I'm young. I'm fit. I'm strong because I'm obeying God. I'm going to continue to do it. If you get mad at me, you better get right with God. Watch out what you say, because I'm speaking prophetically tonight. That means I'm speaking under the protection of God. If you speak against me, God will judge you. Don't say I did not tell you. If I was standing here tonight doing my own thing. But I'm speaking to you what the Lord said to me. He said, do this tonight. Speak this. Speak this whole message. And he's spoken to me this whole last week about it, how to do it. And I'm doing it the best I can as he was telling me to do. Do not speak against me. The time is coming soon. You cannot speak against the prophets of God anymore. You cannot speak against soon anybody in the body of Christ. And God will judge you. Judgment is at the door. Watch out. Wake up. It's here. What are you talking about, Gabriel? We have gone 70 years into the last generation. The final outpouring on the church is about to start. It will start on the church. Isaiah tells you that too. Isaiah 60. It will start in the church. And God is going to clean the house. Amen. Go back and do yourself a favor. And read back in um, Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 26 to 29. The last three verses. Go read that. Then go and look at different tra translations. Look at the message. Go read the message translation. Of Hebrews 12, 26 to 29. And you'll see that God is coming with fire and with vengeance to cleanse the church. You want scripture of what I'm preaching? It's there. It's Old Testament. It's everywhere. It's coming. Because God has to cleanse the church of all the demons, the doctrines, the traditions, the ways of men. The controlling spirits. The controlling spirits. The controlling spirits. You're going to be judged. For letting controlling demons work through you and enslave your people, or whether you're the associate pastor or the worship leader, whatever, you're supposed to flow in the love and authority of the Holy Spirit, but not in a controlling spirit. We had the time tonight to tell you how and why controlling demons get hold of pastors. He catches them when they're weak. All right. So there's so many more of these. But let's look here at uh, Galatians chapter 3. And then I move on. I'm still on the first point. I'm talking about God's warning of impending judgment. I'll go quickly here as fast as I can. I promise you. I'll try not to stay here two hours tonight. But it's important. Now listen to this. I wish you would read this in different translations. I'm going to read this from the Amplified. Galatians chapter 3 
and verses 1 through 4, Paul says this, Oh, you poor and silly and thoughtless and unreflecting and senseless Galatians. I mean, he just stopped short of calling them stupid. What has fascinated or bewitched or cast a spell over you? Unto whom right before your very eyes, Jesus the Messiah was openly crucified for you. Then he says this, let me ask you this one question. Now listen to him carefully. He says, did you receive the Holy Spirit as a result of obeying the law? Or by obeying the gospel message of salvation and truth? Did you get saved because of the law? Or because of the salvation of Jesus? Then the next verse he says, are you so foolish and senseless and silly? Having begun your new life spiritually with the Holy Spirit. Are you now becoming perfect through the law and the works of the law and the works of man? Have you suffered so many things, verse 4, and experienced so much and all for nothing, to no purpose, if it really is to any purpose, but it's all in vain? Now, people, this, this is amazing. There are three points here, real quickly, real quickly. Number one, did you get salvation through the law or through Jesus Christ? Well, obviously, they got salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. There are very few people today who believe that you can get salvation through the law. Every person who's born again knew that Jesus came to give us salvation and we receive salvation through him. There is no salvation through the law. There is no salvation through Moses. Now, this amazes me. There's no pastor that I can think of or that I ever met that would tell you that there's salvation for you through the law. Now, when we start praying, then we go to Old Testament intercession. When we start preaching, we preach Old Testament doctrines. Hello? When we ask people to bring their finances to the church, you do it Old Testament way. Because that's traditionally how we've done it. Well, that's why we're all poor. There is no financial prosperity through the law, just as there's no salvation through the law. When do you think the church is ever going to learn that? Please tell me somebody. What are you talking about? Bring all your tithes and offerings. It's Old Testament. If you read after Jesus. You know Jesus? You know Jesus? You see that Paul tells you by the Holy Spirit. That when he went to the cross. He took our sins and all our diseases and everything upon him. But also 2 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That though he was rich for your sakes on the cross. He became poor that you through his poverty might become rich. On the cross, Jesus purchased a full salvation for us. And Paul mentions separately the act of giving us financial wealth through the cross. Everything that you receive as a Christian came through what Jesus did on the cross. If it's not, you're in error, you're in rebellion, and you make Jesus mad. I'm going to tell the truth. I'm going to tell the truth. The Lord said to me, I'm holding you to it. You're going to tell the truth. We will never tell our people that there's any salvation for them through the law. When it comes to money, well, just bring the tithe. That was through the law. The law, by the way, did not die, as I said earlier on, when Jesus died. The law did not die when Jesus was resurrected. The law died when he was born. If not, he was a breaker of the law and he was a sinner. Because he broke the law. Why do you think Jesus broke the law everywhere? He went. To become a sinner? The law was no longer in effect, honey. Yet most churches today, they take the law and mix it in with the New Testament. You know, just like you take the green Gatorade and mix it in with the green antifreeze of the car. You keep drinking that, you think you're going to be healthy? <laughs> this is the number one reason today why the church is in a mess. There's no Holy Ghost. There's no power of God. There's no presence of God. There's no signs and wonders. There's no salvations. And the world look at us, look at us and say, they are religious. Yes, they are. We're religious about a religious system that tells you about Jesus, but God is not there. God is not in it. God's no part of it. And we think we do wonderful. Let me tell you right now. Jesus looks at the church. I, I tell you, forgive me for saying it. People can be so stupid. Christians. Oh, I wish I can see Jesus. If only I can see Jesus. Let me tell you, if you see Jesus tonight, you will shake and fear and tremble and fall on the floor. He has fire in his eyes for the church. Because everything he's told the church to do, and everything is given to the Holy Spirit to bring to the church. Everything the Holy Ghost has reminded us, us to do and how to live. We turn up the opposite. We've disobeyed Him in everything except confessing Him as Lord and Savior. 
After that, we threw everything away and became part of a man-made and a demon-supported religious Christian system of Christianity. We tell you right now, as soon as the fire of God falls, all of this crap is going to be burned to shreds and pieces. Every demon, every demon spirit of tradition and religion and control and sin and garbage that the church is full of now is going to burn in the fire of God very soon. The fire of God that's coming. I tell people, the fire of God's coming. It's going to be awesome. Oh yeah, I know. The fire of God hit me before. This is not, this outpouring that's coming is not a half an hour fire visitation. It's not an hour fire visitation. Besides that, it's not the fire of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit said to me, the fire that's coming comes straight from the Father. This comes from the top. This comes from the throne of God. Have you seen the book of Ezekiel? This fire from his waist down and up. This is fire. He's going to take his own fire and cast it on the church. And demons will run and hope to find the end of the earth. And some will jump an ocean. And most of what we believe and what we teach incorrectly is going to be burned up. Most of what we have, most of how we worship is going to be burned up. When the fire gets done, we'll sit with nothing. Then God will fill us with his glory. And then say, go get my harvest. I am not talking about something that's 50 years in the future. I'm talking about something that can start this year, next year, on the next few years. Because we're 70 years. We should warn the church. And I challenge every pastor. All the way we, we preach and all the games we play and stuff. That's how I know all the games. I've been there 61 years in the church. Get up and say, in the name of Jesus, I give this church the Holy Spirit. Amen. And if you don't want it, you have to go somewhere else. I'm going to sit down in this chair. We're going to worship until God tells us what to do. Until God tells me what to preach. Until God tells me what to do. God, the Holy Ghost. Because the Holy Ghost is God. Amen. He's the only one that's on the earth. Yes. He's the only one that lives in your spirit. Jesus is with the Father. The right hand of the Father. But we don't teach this kind of truth. Which is always religious hogwash. And you will be held in, in, in accountability before God for everything that you preach that is not the truth. Well, my denomination, forget your abomination. You're going to stand before Jesus and say, well, you know, uh, and he stands there with fire in his eyes and tell him, well, my denomination told me to preach this because, you know, they pay my pension. I'm telling you, we are in serious, serious trouble. No one knows the day when God's end time plan. This is God's end time plan. Outpouring fire of glory. Transformation of the church. Outpouring of the spirit and fire all over the world. End time revival. End time harvest coming of Jesus. That's God's end time plan. That is the final segment of his plan. We're on the threshold of it. We've reached 70 years of the final generation. And people go on every day. Churches go on every Sunday as if Jesus is never coming. I don't know because I'm not in every church. But from what I've seen in the last 35 years in America... The church is prophetically pathetic. Who gets up on Sunday and says, Folks, do you know when the 70th year? Do you realize what is about to happen? Do you realize what God's plan is? Do you realize that we are the final generation? That we are the ones that see what God calls through the Apostle Paul the climax of the ages? When you'll take this whole earth like a leaf in the wind and shake it until it all falls down and come to Him. Well, at least 90 plus percent. People think this end time harvest is you and me, Jack and Anne, us four no more. It's the multitudes of the people of the earth. It's not in God's a liar, but he's not a liar. When he says Pentecost, he means he's going to strip the field down just like the Jewish feast of Pentecost. Now, I'm already off my notes, whatever, who cares? Now, let me ask you this. That brings me to my second point. Who has authority? Who has authority in the earth? Now, I'm not talking about the Lord. Of course, God, the Holy Spirit, is God and is the ultimate authority in the earth and in the church. But you can refuse him, as 95% of Christians have or more. You can refuse him, as most pastors have, but not for much longer, because he's about to take the church back with fire and with judgment. So... Do not say that you're not forewarned. You can laugh at me tonight. You can get mad. You can cuss at me. Whatever you want to do. But you'll stand before the Lord. But I'm telling you this tonight. I'm giving you an urgent word from God. If you're a Christian, you're in trouble. If you're a pastor, you're in deep trouble. If you're not under the power and auspices and control of the Holy Spirit, you're in deep trouble right now. I'm going to say it to you again. This does not give me any pleasure. You say, oh, well, he's this false prophet. You can, you can say whatever you want about me. The Lord will judge you for it anyway. But this is the truth. 
we're about to come into the place of judgment. We've heard it for, for ages and we don't believe anything. So don't believe anything if you don't want it tonight. And when I'm speaking to you tonight, it's not open for discussion. It's not a teaching. It's not an exhortation. It's a prophetic word from God. You either believe it or you don't. You either receive it or you don't. But be careful what you say about it. Be careful what you say about me. Be really careful. Really careful. Here is an opportunity for us to receive this warning and make the changes necessary. What do you mean? Go on your face and cry out to the Holy Spirit. Say, Forgive me for ignoring you, for working against you, whatever it is. Holy Spirit, be part of my life. Take control of my life. Speak to me. Begin a fellowship with me. Begin to talk to him. Begin to seek his presence until he breaks through and brings his presence and his own personal self to you. That's Christianity. Everything else is religion. Now, let's talk about authority. Who has authority? As people who have authority in the earth. 1 Corinthians 10.32 Paul says, If no offense to the Jews, to the heathen, or church of God. There's three groups of people in the world, really. The lost, Israel, and the church. Who has authority? Of those three groups of people, who has the authority? Jesus said, go in my name. I authorize you. All authority has been given unto me. I sent you. Go in my name. Make disciples of all. Cast out demons. Lay hands on the sick. Speak in other tongues. In my name. See, the authority we have is two ways. Number one, it's when you're born again. When you're not born again, you have no authority. If you're just churchified, not justified, you don't have any authority. You don't even have salvation. You have many people in our church that don't even have salvation. Many denominations that don't even preach salvation. We have some dear precious friends and, and partners over in Texas. Precious people. Bunch of them there, really. But with Nancy and Clements, Tremiska. Brother Clement said to me years ago when we first met, he said about 46 or 47 years, he was born and raised in the Catholic Church. He said, I never heard the word salvation. I never knew that I needed to be born again. He said, I knew nothing. Why? Because the Catholic Church is a cult. Most churches today are cults because they don't preach the truth of the New Testament. And they don't bring people to, to be confronted with salvation and the truth of the gospel. It's a cult. No matter what's on the door, no matter how many crosses there are outside or on the rooftop, it's a cult. And you'll answer to God. And real soon. Who has authority? Who has the authority? Jesus said go in my name. If you read through the epistles. Which is where we live. We are the church. The word of the New Testament is not in the gospels. It's not in the Old Testament. It's in the epistles. That's where you live. The rest is good history. Great miracles you learn from. History you learn from. But you can't live there. If you live there you make Jesus mad. I'm sorry, most churches do this on Sunday. They praise the Lord, they get through the praise and worship, and then they put on their toilet and their yarmulke, they start blowing the ram's horn, and they go back in the Old Testament. It's like, Jesus, I love you, I love you, and then pff, spit in his face. Pff. Jesus, I love you, I love you, spit in his face. Every time you go back in the Old Testament, and you live by anything that's in the Old Testament of the Lord, you're actually saying to Jesus, forget you, your salvation was not complete, I've got to go back and still practice some of the law. If you practice one thing of the law, you're saying to Jesus, your salvation was a failure. You're a failure. This is a serious spiritual sin that nobody seems to worry about. Churches and Christians do this all over the world every Sunday. Fire is coming. I'm telling you people, fire is coming. You better repent. They repent. Get out of the Old Testament. There's some trying to live in the tribulation era. Well, tomorrow God's going to destroy the world. No, honey, this is the time of harvest. People call me and say, is the economy going to collapse? I say, no, it's going to grow and grow and grow and multiply because the money's coming to us so we can get this harvest in the opposite. Amen. All the junk that's been taught, all the old, old end time message junk and garbage that the devil has preached to the church. Oh, it angers me. No, honey, the next thing coming is the fire. You make it through the fire, you're going to be part of the glory. You'll be part of the harvest. You'll be part of the outpouring. You'll be part of the revival. You're part of the miraculous. And you'll have a destiny in this final hour like no generation before you have or no generation ever in the future, even through the whole thousand year reign of the millennium of Christ, will have. This is the greatest hour of human history. Paul rightfully calls this final day, this final hour of the church, rightfully calls this the climax of all the ages. The greatest hour, the greatest moment, the greatest season of human history for the church. And the church is the one that looks around and doesn't even care about it. 
Don't even know about it. We have been given the authority in and through Jesus' name. Number one. Number two, that authority comes through the person and the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, we live in the time of the church, the church era. It's not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. But in most churches, the pastors say, not by might, not by power, but my, by myself. The way I determine. You're going to die when the fire hits you, pastor. I'll be the one to tell you straight. And I pray to God you don't. I pray to God you repent. People call me all the time. How do I, make, how, how do I get out of this into the Holy Ghost? How do I get, pastors sometimes call me. How do I make the change? I'll come and help you. That's what I do. My phone doesn't ring off the hook. Because people don't know they're about to die. They don't know it's become a matter of urgency. I've, I've been holding back on this for years. I don't want to say this. Last week the Lord said to me, you'll say it, you'll say it next Saturday night on the 17th. You'll say it. If you don't say it, you'll answer to me. I said, I'm going to say it. I'm going to say all of it. Because as much as I love Jesus, I fear him. Mm -hmm. I've never seen him with fire in his eyes. And I plan on never seeing him look at me that way ever. You may have fire in your eyes. That'd be fine. I'll deal with that. But not Jesus. We have the authority. Now let me tell you what the Holy Spirit said last week. Because I'm going to let it all hang out tonight. You can get mad and cuss whatever you want to do. I don't care. I'm going to obey God. If you know me, you know I obey God. To my own hurt many times. But I obey God. We have authority in the earth. Now, the Lord said this to me many times before, but he really zeroed in on last week. He said, everything that happens in this earth that is not good is permitted and sanctioned by the church. Mm. Who has the authority? Jesus even said, when you tell people their sins are forgiven, them, they're forgiven. When you tell them the sins are not forgiven because they're not born again, those sins will be retained against them. We have the authority. Ephesians 1, the whole New Testament. Jesus gave himself to us as the head of the body and has placed everything under our feet. We are the body. Even if you are the little toe tonight, the devil and demons, sickness, disease, misery, everything is placed under your feet. Now, here's what Christians do, and it angers the Lord, frustrates him. We go call a special intercessory prayer meeting because we're going to bind the devil. You're not going to bind the devil as long as he's permission, given permission to do what he wants to do. The church for 2,000 years has not been able to operate in her authority. Why not? I told you. Because we sin against Jesus, and go back under the old covenant and spit in his face. And number two, we tell the Holy Ghost, get the heck out of here because I'm the pastor. I'm going to run this thing the way I want to. That's the story of the church of 2,000 years. Go back and study. I have in detail studied the whole history of the church of 2,000 years. That's the story. That's the reason why we're not able to exercise authority in the earth. And we have compromised our authority. We haven't lost it. We've compromised it. So we said to the devil, do it. now we go and bind and loose and then we fast for it. Oh, we love the works. We love the Old Testament works of the law. Churches thrive on that. People feel good. They can get into all those works of the law that Jesus fulfilled when he was born, dummy. And we go into this long fast. Old Testament. In the New Testament, you can only fast if the Holy Ghost tells you. In the New Testament, you're supposed to do what the Holy Spirit says. And, and the things you're supposed to do in the Word, He'll show you and point out to you when and how He's supposed to. Everything in the New Testament is supposed to be under the authority and direction and instruction of God, the Holy Spirit. But that hasn't happened for 2,000 years. So we don't know what the heck that is about anyway. The Lord has run me through these things. Go back to January 1st, 1901. Holy Ghost being poured out in Topeka, Kansas. And from then, regular outpourings. 1904, 1906, 1907, 1927, 1947, 1967, 1987. Every 20 year, a whole fresh new outpouring of God here in America that goes to the whole world. Well, it starts here because God chose America. God called America. He showed me that in 1979. And he told me, he said, a major attack will come against this nation to try and destroy America because he's called America to lead the world into this last day revival. Very simple. Well, I don't like America. That's your problem. God said to me in December of 1979, 40 years ago next year, He said, I like America. I chose America to lead the world in the last day revivals. Little did I know then 
that's been happening since 1906. He said, I chose America. And the Lord started to run me through all these events. All these things that happened. Even from the time the Holy Ghost was poured out, you think the church would embrace Holy Spirit and bring it back in the church? No. Now we'll have revival for a while. When the revival cools down, we go back to the vomit of our tradition and religion and our disgusting man-made system of Christianity. Religious theology, Christianity. It's a stinking thing in the nostrils of God. Whether you're Baptist or Presbyterian or Pentecostal, it doesn't matter. It's the same stinking stuff that's in God's nostrils. And he's about to blow it out for the last time. Go back. Why did World War I take place? Because the church rejected the Pentecostal move of 1906 through 1914. And the same year the final rejection took place, World War I started. Why did we have the Great Depression? Because in the 1920s, God sent a great new outpouring of the Spirit. And the church rejected that, and it brought the Great Depression. That outpouring of God carried over into the 1930s. The church rejected that again, so we had World War II. And October 20th, 1962, we almost got into nuclear war. Global nuclear war with Russia. Because the church again took that great revival of 1947. Healing miracle revival. And, and, and the great latter rain revival coming together. And two, two revivals into one in the 40s and the 50s. And the church said again, sorry, we don't want this. The church at large has always rejected what the spirit of God would do. Did you hear me? The church at large. Not just Baptist, Presbyterian, Dutch reform. In modern times. The Pentecostal church that has revival or movement has revival. When the next revival comes 20 years later, they reject the new revival because it's not the same as the one they had. The church has always rejected what God does. I'm surprised sometimes the, world, the church is still here. The church has spat in God's face, has cursed the Holy Ghost and thrown him out the door and said, he's of the devil. When the revival came in 1901, 1902, 1903, 4, 5, 6, tongues was of the devil. Then healing came, then healing was of the devil. Then deliverance came, then deliverance is of the devil. Then the prophetic came, then prophetic is of the devil. It's amazing how the church takes, has taken everything that God the Holy Ghost has, has brought sacredly and holy and called it of the devil. I'm surprised the church is still in existence. It only is because Jesus said, I'll keep this thing alive even while it's cursing me, I'll keep it alive. Because I still have a purpose in the end, I'll deliver it and turn it into glory. Because it's my body, I'm going to cleanse, cleanse this thing. Boy, you bet he's going to cleanse this thing. And it's filthy from head to toe. It is filthy. It's not dirty. It's filthy. We have the authority. All these things. The revival that came in 1987 started real small. God showed me that when he first put me in the prophet's office on Sunday afternoon, October 19, 1986. He said to me, here's what God had. showed me the whole thing. Came in my office that day and showed me the whole thing. Not because I prayed or fasted or do other stupid stuff. Because he called me as a prophet. And I was responsible. The moment he gave it to me. He said go to America and declare this revival. If you're faithful it will come. Wow you're somebody else. No I just got an assignment. All prophets get assignments. There are not many prophets in the church today. Most of them are charlatans. They run around with familiar spirits. And read you your mail. You think they're a prophet. They give a big offering and move on to the next church. You die. Those people die. They're the first ones to die when the fire hits them. Hello? Hello? According to Jesus. You know about Jesus? Okay, about Jesus, you know? Jesus said, Holy Spirit will lead you. John 16, 13. He will lead you and guide you into all truth. How much? All truth. The Holy Spirit is your guide. Prophets are not your guide in the New Testament, people. In the Old Testament, it was. That doesn't mean a prophet won't have a word for you. But it's not every day, every place, every church, every person. That is error. And I would even, when I came to America, I was a young prophet. And I would preach and I'd see something in people's lives. And after the service, I'd call them and tell them. And the Lord started to rebuke me. He said, I have a relationship. So I hear from him. He said, did I tell you to prophesy over that person? I said, no, Lord, but I saw what was happening. He said, did I tell you to give them a word? I said, no, not really, but I saw it clearly. He said, did I tell you to talk to them and give them the word? I said, no. He said, you cannot give the word just because you see something. You have to have me tell you to give it when and how. That's how it works. I'm in control, not you. Amen. When I show you something in somebody's life or a pastor's life, doesn't mean you run over there and go and blab it all out. You wait for me. If I never tell you, you never do it. You only do it when I tell you. I said, but Lord, 
if you never tell me, what's the reason? He said, because I give it to you that in the next service in that same church, you can preach into it without putting anybody on the spot. And you can answer the question. You can sort out the problem without putting anybody out there. You can just generally minister. And the Lord showed me how to minister into things. He showed me. Many times when I preach, I look out at people. I see the things in their lives. And the Lord started giving me a word how to minister into it without putting them on the spot. Because according to the New Testament, New Testament, not Old Testament. In the Old Testament, nobody could have the Holy Spirit but the priest, prophet, and king. In the New Testament, Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes, John 16, 13. John 16, 13. And read the whole context there. He will lead you and guide you into truth. No, all truth. All truth. That means you can only prophesy over somebody when God tells you. And you can only prophesy over somebody as a prophet when the Holy Ghost sends you to them and say, give them this word and give it now. If you do it in any other fashion, you're disobedient to God, you're in rebellion, you violate the authority of the Holy Spirit over the church, and you're in trouble. But brother, all these prophetic meetings I go to, that's what they're doing. It's a circus. The church is a mad, crazy circus. Not for much longer now. The fire is coming. The fire is coming. The fire is coming. You better get yourself straightened out. And, and the warning here is more for us as ministers. Yeah, individuals too. But the more people, I'm going to say it again, the more people you have authority over, the more serious your judgment is going to be. The more people that you rob of the Holy Spirit and the true ministry of the Holy Spirit, the more serious and more severe your judgment will be. All of the stuff in the church. We have authority. With every great move of God, 1907, 27, 47, 67, 87, at the end of that move came a judgment when the church at large would reject. The church has always rejected every move of God. Not everybody, but the majority. And in 2000, the year of August 2000, the Lord said to me, as you know now, the church has now rejected the joy and refreshing revival also. He said, here are the consequences. He said, number one, this revival will end in five years. By 2005, be gone. Number one. Number two, the church will go through an extended period of spiritual drought, especially in America. And number three, he said, a door has been opened onto the Muslim spirit to come in and to try and take over this nation because I've chosen this nation to be my instrument for the global revival of these last days. And I was sick. I wanted to vomit. Excuse me for saying the word. I wanted to vomit all of the month of August 2000. I was weeping, crying. I said, Lord, help me. Eventually the Holy Spirit just came and put his arms around me and loved me. Because I, I, I was just shocked. I was, I was just broken. Hey, I want to be a prophet. It's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. At times when it's the hardest thing to be. At times when it's the most glorious thing. It's times when it's hard. I'm telling you the truth tonight. I don't know if there's other prophets in America telling you the truth. I'm sure there are. But i got to do my part. That's what the Lord said to me. He did this tonight. Now, Amen. when there's revival, I speak in front of thousands of people. When it's not revival, I speak this in front of a camera. That's when prophets speak in the place of seclusion or in the desert. I speak in the desert tonight because the church is in the desert. Back in the revival days, I preached to thousands of people. Now it would be a miracle you get 20, 30, 40 people together. Why? Because the church is backslidden and half dead. Now, the same thing in the world. Now, here is the judgment that's coming next. There's coming a judgment of obstacles. This will come first. And then when the fire hits the church, then with the great judgment of the church, but then the transformation of the church. This is not really a judgment on people. That's coming now. This is what the Lord wanted me to tell you about. There's coming a judgment starting this next year that will be in society, be in the world. I just, I just put a word to it. I call it the judgment of obstacles. Now, I'm going to speak some things to you. Please don't get in the flesh with me about this. This is spiritual. God chose this nation to be the instrument of this last day revival. To the whole world. This is the hub. This is the headquarters. So the devil knows he has to, if he can take over America, he can destroy God's plan. Now, the church opened the door for the Muslim spirit to come in. The Lord showed me, August 2000, he said to me, there will be a Muslim president in this country before long. And there was. And the moment he was chosen as president, I knew he'd been for two terms. I knew we were in for eight years of tearing America apart. 
Now, you have to guard yourself, whether you're an individual or an institution, you have to guard yourself against the devil. The devil was looking for the open door to the Oval Office. The Republican Party, I'm not saying they were better, they did not open the door. At the time, the Democratic Party opened the door. Now, if you look at the Democratic Party today, this is not political, this is spiritual. They are absolutely gone in their mind. God has given them over to a reprobate mind. The doctrines or principles that they held to in the 90s are now gone. The principles they hold to now are for the destruction of this nation. I don't understand how anybody can vote for them. But they opened themselves to the devil, and the devil came in and took over the Democratic Party. That's why all they can do is attack people, scream, resist, and so on. Now, the Lord has given them an opportunity in the house with this last... Let me tell you why they won this election in the house. The Lord said, I will give them one final opportunity to redeem themselves. To go from resistance and obstruction and war to doing something constructive for the American people. They are on the hot seat now. Be careful what you wish for, Democratic Party. Now, you'll have to live up to it. Now, you'll have to break free of the power of the devil that's controlled you for so long. Let me tell you what happened. The door was opened unto the devil, to this country. It started at 9-11-2001, and that door closed on Tuesday, November the 8th, 2016. God told me this. I preached it all over this country. He closed the door. It doesn't mean the next day everything is a paradise on earth. It means the authority has been revoked. The authority of the Muslim spirit and the Jezebel spirit and all of those demons, their authority was revoked the night when Trump won the election. Trump is not the greatest person in the world, but God chose him to do a job. And he's doing that job. What is that job? He said to me, he'll restore the country uh, economically and financially and even morally. But what is coming next is a judgment of God on all those who stand in his way for his plan with America. See, we're running out of time now. We've had the election in 2016. For two years, all the Democrats did was fight against God. They're not fighting against Trump. They're fighting against God. Saul went out to Damascus. The Lord didn't say to him, you're fighting against the Christians. He said, you're fighting against me. This is not a political issue. It's a spiritual issue. You've got to start seeing it for what it is. It's a spiritual issue. The door was open and the devil took over the Democratic Party. That's why today they don't believe nothing of what they believed when Clinton was president. Because he gave them over to a reprobate mind. The mind is taken over by the devil. That's why the things they speak are totally illogical. I mean, it's like they're crazy, the things that they say and they do, because their mind has been taken over by the devil. Now they get one last opportunity of God in the house to be constructive, to work for the American people, to pass good legislation. If not, their failure in 2020 will be twice what it was in 2016. Now, here's what you have to understand. It's all about time. Of course, the church never bothers about time. Never look at the time. Never look at prophetic time. Never look at the clock of God. We live our natural lives by the clock. And when it comes to spiritual things, oh, forget that. You know, we're not interested. Well, right now, we're standing on the threshold of the outpouring of God's fire upon the church. Before that can happen, God has got to sort out and get some obstacles out of the way that are out there in society. And the number one area is the political. Here's what he said to me. You don't have to pray about this. This is prophetic. That means God already made it before time. And then put it in the time slot, and when the time comes, boom, it manifests. God, why is it so hard to help the church understand the prophetic? They always tell me how prophetic they are. They're mostly pathetic. They don't know anything about the prophetic. The prophetic means that God has times and seasons for certain events that were, that were predetermined and pre-made and downloaded into time before time. That's what that means. You don't have to pray for circumstances or for events, prophetic events. Pray for dumb people who don't want to be part of what God, because they have a will to say no to God. The circumstances and the earth don't have a will to say no to God. The prophetic events will come to pass, like, like Israel. You know, I'm Jewish, okay, fine, so I can talk about it. People always pray for Israel. God's plan with Israel is intact. And it's going to unfold exactly as he planned it before time. Did you get that? You can pray, pray for the Jews that they see Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and not go into the tribulation. But Israel, in the end, all Israel will be saved. At Armageddon, all Israel will be saved. But I don't want them. I don't want them. These are my own people. I don't want them to go through seven years of tribulation. I pray every day, Lord, open the eyes of every Jewish person that they can see Jesus as Christ the Messiah. Oh, they can be born again. Hallelujah. Every time the Arabs threaten Israel, everybody call a fast, the 40 days, all this religious stuff and junk. 
And then they bind and loose and intercede, whatever, all these things they do in the flesh. Because things that are already determined in the spirit, you cannot copy in the flesh. When it's already done in the spirit, you cannot even do it in the spirit. It's already done. The determination of Israel is already set. The determination of the church is already set. The determination of the end time harvest is already set. Amen. Jesus didn't say pray for the harvest. He said pray for the laborers. Don't pray for the event. Pray for the people. Do you think the church will ever get that? God, I preach this for 36 years. Right. People just never get it. You don't pray for the event. You pray for the people. Because the event doesn't have a will and a mind of its own to say no. It's going to happen because God pre-scheduled it. But the people can say no. And do say no all the time. The church says no every day. To the Holy Spirit. To living in the New Testament. To walking with the Spirit of God. To be submitted to Him. To prepare for what's coming. The church says no every day. And twice on Sunday. It aggravates me sometimes people come and say, well, you know, we had a great revival in the 90s, but you know, the devil killed it. The devil cannot kill nothing that God does. Are you crazy? Are you kidding me? God does something and the devil kills it? Really? So then the devil will be God. Are you kidding me? We killed it. We. I'm not speaking French when I say we. I mean us, the church. We are the rebels against God's plan and revival. The church rebel against Jesus as Lord, but we rebel against everything God wants to do. That's our job. Because we yield to spirits of the devil instead of Holy Spirit. Holy what? Holy Spirit. Holy what? Holy macro. No, no. Holy Spirit. Holy what? Holy cow. No. Holy Spirit. What the heck is that? Not what? Who is he? He's God. He's God. And soon you'll stand in judgment for having rejected. By the time the fire gets here, if you have not changed and gone after God the Holy Spirit and befriend Him and start walking with Him, you will receive judgment through the fire of God. And if you're a pastor or a leader or a moderator, you're dead. You're dead. You stand between the Holy Spirit and God's people. Time's running out. Time's running out. But now, what is going to happen in the world? At any time now, God's end time plan can begin. The outpouring of the fire of God and the glory of God on the church. But before that can happen, before that can begin, the Lord has to clear the way in the earth because, especially in America, there's an economic and financial and moral revival that has to take place. The economic revival is already taking place. The financial revival is starting. It's beginning to tell the difference in people's pockets. That's the second part of it. The third part of it's moral. And the Lord has to stop the work of obstruction, especially in Washington in politics. So here's what's going to happen. Make it short and sweet. There's some of those people that are one day in office, the next day they're not there. They'll be in office now, and the next thing, 2020, they're up for re-election, they're gone. Or more will happen. Suddenly they've taken ill seriously and can't can't be in Congress or in the Senate anymore. Some of them will die. You see, people, you can, you can live for 70 years on this earth and, obs and, and obstruct or be, or be in opposition to God's plan. But there'll be no judgment coming to you until one day suddenly when that plan begins to work, when that plan is put into implementation, then you can lose your life. That's what people don't understand. We don't know when the Lord is going to start pouring out the fire on the church. I know it's very soon. This is year number 70. But before he does that, he told me, he said, there's coming a judgment. I have to move politically. I have to move financially. I have to move economically. I have to move in circles and bring judgment. I call it the judgment of obstacles. He's going to remove the, the obstacles, politically, financially, the corruption in the corporate world, all of that. He's going to, he's going to do a cleansing in the world system. That's what this next judgment is. It's a cleansing in the world system. Of everything and everyone who directly stands in the way of his plan. So he's got to take the broom and sweep the house clean of the earth. Starting with America. He's got to do this everywhere. That will inevitably mean that many people will lose their work or their, their position, their power. Some of them will die. When this starts happening, they say, well, I wasn't prepared for that. I'm telling you right now. That's the next thing to happen. Then after that, it's the fire of God on the church that will bring judgment and death but absolute renovation, refurbishing, cleansing, purifying, and perfection by the Spirit of God. 
for the rest of the church. You choose whether you're going to be unto honor or dishonor. You choose whether you're going to be part of the end time army full of the fire and transformation of the fire or whether you're going to die by the fire. You choose. And there's much more that I can say, but I'm going to start wrapping it up right here because I always preach too long. And this is not a preaching tonight. This is a prophetic word. I want to say this to you tonight. I have not given the last 35 years of my life just to be mad at you tonight. I'm not mad at you. I'm not mad at the world. I'm mad at anybody. But I quiver inside, I do. There is a fear in me for what's coming. And like you and every person, I better make sure that my, sure that my slate is clean when this fire gets here. Everything. Everything in my life. Everything in my life. And I'm going to be, I was born for this. We were born for this. This is what we were born for. We were born for the climax of the ages, the greatest event of all of human history. The last day outpouring of the Spirit, global revival and harvest of all the nations of the world for the coming of the Lord Jesus on the clouds of glory. We were born unto this. And like the church can say, well, we don't, we don't even know about it. We don't care. We don't believe that. Well, how come nobody's preaching it? Because the church at large is part of a religious system that's void of God. It's full of using the name of Jesus, using scripture, some of it in context, some out of context. It's a religion. Just like the church, like the world says, they look at us and they classify us as one of the religions of the world. And they're correct because what we've portrayed to them for 2,000 years is a system of religion. That's why they're not saved. That's why 33% have answered the call at most. But I'm saying this to you tonight in love. Do not criticize what I'm saying, please. If you don't like it, fine. Just leave it alone. Don't speak against this. Don't speak against what I said tonight. You'll be judged. The time is short. It's before us right now. You can't do it anymore. You can't let your tongue run wild and just cut things to pieces and people to pieces. You've got to quit. You've got to stop. You've got to get control of your tongue and of your temper. You've got to go before God, humble yourself, say, Lord, forgive me, help me, protect me from the things the devil wants me to do. I'm going to serve you. So in the name of Jesus, I'm going to close this broadcast. There's more I can say, but this is, this is, the, this is the heart of the matter. And I pray that you'll take this to heart. There's some of you out there, if you need us, we've got a website, we've got phone numbers, call us, write us, we'll help you. There's pastors out there, you need our help, we we'll come and help you. We don't bring a message of condemnation, we bring a message of revival. We bring a message of returning to the Holy Spirit. We bring a message of getting your people to God, to the Holy Ghost. We uh, bring a message of getting ready for the fire, the revival, the greatest event of all the time of human mankind on the earth. But tonight I had to speak a word of judgment, warning of the judgment that's coming. And I'm going to go sleep good tonight. Put my head in the pillow. Father, in Jesus' name, I am a human being. I'm imperfect. With the help of the Holy Spirit, I've done as well as I could. Please help where I've fallen short, where I was imperfect because I'm human. Holy Spirit, you have access to the hearts of every person, even the lost. But most of all, your children. Please, would you perfect what I... Portray tonight from you and from the Father, from Jesus to the church. In Jesus' name. For the time is urgent. The hour is late. The fire is coming. It's beckoning. And the time of judgment, but the time of the greatest transformation and revival of the earth is before us. We want to be part of that. Our destiny is in that. Help us, Lord, each and every one of us to fall down before you and embrace you, Holy Spirit. And love you and worship you, Jesus. And don't sin against you. By trying to slaughter the lamb on Sundays for our sins. In the name of Jesus, I curse every spirit, every demon, every spirit of the devil, every religious spirit that will speak against what I've spoken tonight. I curse you in the name of Jesus. You will suffer double or triple punishment in hell forever if you stand against us. I curse you in the name of Jesus. I call the fire of God on you even now in Jesus' name for trying to deceive God's people. Thank you, Lord, for having your will and your way. In Jesus' name, God bless you. We love you. Please ask people to watch this. Ask them to pray before they watch it. And be very careful what you say. I humbly submit to you in the name of Jesus. I brought you tonight what God said. And I'll stand by it for all eternity. And I know I'm going to sleep good tonight. God bless you. Thank you for watching. I'm Gabriel Haymans. I hope to see you next time. Send this message out to everybody. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you be glorified. Lord Jesus, I pray that you be glorified. Holy Spirit, I pray that you be glorified in the earth. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God, you alone. I humble myself and I hide myself behind you. Thank you for giving me the honor to speak on your behalf. 
through the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. Visit our website, GabrielHaymansMinistries.com. Come on, people. Send an offering. Send a prayer request. Be part of this in Jesus' name. Get up and do it. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Thank you and good night.